Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the Hampstead School Board meeting of Tuesday, October 13th. Before we begin, I will read our remote meeting statement. As chair of the Hampstead School Board, I find that due to the state of emergency declared by the governor as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and in accordance with the governor's emergency order number 12, pursuant to executive order 2020-04, this public body is authorized to meet electronically. Please note that there is no physical location to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting, which was authorized pursuant to the governor's emergency order. However, in ac accordance with the emergency order, I am confirming that we are A, providing public access to the meeting by telephone. We are utilizing Zoom for this electronic meeting. All members of the board have the ability to communicate contemporaneously during this meeting through this platform and the public has access to contemporaneously listen to this meeting by dialing the following phone number, 888-475-4499 or 877-853-5257. B, providing public notice of the necessary information for accessing the meeting. We previously gave notice to the public of the necessary information for accessing the meeting, including how to access the meeting using Zoom telephonetically. Instructions have also been provided on the district website at hampstedschools.net. C, providing a mechanism for the public to alert the public body during the meeting if there are problems with access. If anybody has a problem, please email hmstechnology at hampstedschools.net. D, adjourning the meeting if the public is unable to access the meeting. In the event the public is unable to access the meeting, the meeting will be adjourned and rescheduled. Please note that all votes that are taken during this meeting shall be done by roll call vote. Melissa, will you please call the roll call attendance? Yes. Megan Malcolm? I'm here alone in the room. There's other family members in the house. Caitlin Parnell? Here, I'm alone in the room. There are other family members in the house. David Smith? I'm here alone in the room and others are in the house. Jim Sweeney? Here, alone in the room, other family members are in the house. Thank you. Karen Yasenka? Here, alone in my office, there are other people in the house. And executive consultant, Dr. Earl Metzler? Present in my home office, and there are other members of my family in the house. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Melissa. Um, first item on the uh, agenda, ne well, next item on the agenda is um, approval of minutes. We have three sets of minutes uh, this week to look, to approve. We have the September 22nd regular meeting and then the October 6th special meeting and non-public meeting minutes. We'll take a moment to review and when people are ready, we can uh, talk about a motion. Would anyone like to make a motion? I think we have to do them separate, so I'll, um, I'll make motion to accept the uh, regular meeting minutes from September 22nd. Uh, we can do them all together as long as we list them, um, unless anyone has um, a desire to separate them out to make changes. Either way. 
Excuse Madam yep. Chair, I'd like to separate them out because I have to vote differently. I wasn't here okay. October 6th. Right. Okay. Yep, you're right. Sorry about that. Okay, so David, your motion was for the 22nd? Second. Okay, Melissa, will you, uh, is there any discussion for the meeting minutes of the 22nd? Okay, uh, Melissa, will you please call the roll vote? Ms. Malcolm? Yes. Mrs. Parnell? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mr. Sweeney? Yes. Mrs. Yusenka? Yes. Okay, motion carries. Okay, thank you. Um, can we have a motion for the public and non-public meeting minutes of uh, October 6th? So moved. Okay, do we have a second? Second. Okay. okay. Any discussion or questions? Seeing and hearing none, Melissa, will you please call the vote? Ms. Malcolm? Yes. Mrs. Parnell? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mr. Sweeney? Yes. Mrs. Yusenka? I abstain. Thank you. Motion still carries. Okay, thank you. Um, so next up, we have um, the process in place for public comments. Um, uh, my information is that we did not receive any public comment requests. Melissa, is that correct? That is correct information. Okay, thank you. Uh, as a reminder for anyone who didn't see our last meeting, um, the process is now, um, well, you can look back at that meeting to outline the process, but there is a link on the posted agendas that are posted online um, where you can submit a form um, for public comment. Um, you will be called on during these meetings. Um, if you submit that, you'll be able to have your public comments for the three minute allotted time. And um, it does need to be received by 4 p.m. the day of the meeting, which gives us time to get set for that. So that is that. On to current business. Um, the first item on the agenda for current business is a Hampstead Middle School donation. Mrs. Danola. Hello, everyone. Are you? Yes, the Hampstead Educational Foundation has uh, donated $1,000. Uh, their goal is to enhance the educational experience of Hampstead children, and I'm requesting permission to accept this donation. Excellent. Do we have a motion? So moved. Second. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, any comments or questions before we vote? I would just like to say thank you very much to uh, the Hampstead Educators Association for um, all they do and for the donation. Melissa, will you please call the vote? Yes, Ms. Malcolm. Yes. Mrs. Parnell? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mr. Sweeney? Yes, and thank you. Mrs. Yusenka? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you. Okay, um, next up we have the draft facilities three to five year plan. Uh, Mr. Mackey, I believe you'll be speaking to us about this. Hi, uh, yes. Welcome. Hey, Jeff. Yes. Hello. What's going on? So here we have, I uh, basically drew out a rough draft for, you know, what would be a potential five-year plan. Uh, I'll, both schools have quite a bit of similarities once you get looking at it. Um, you know, I, I focused more on um, general areas such as parking lot, roof, HVAC, plumbing, electrical, the structural integrity of the building itself, playgrounds, and grounds. 
with that being said, um, I mean, pretty self-explanatory parking lots. We know both schools are in need of parking lot work and roadway work. Um, my plan would be for that to be a, uh, you know, let's attack it in five different sections to make it attainable through the next five years and both schools the way they're set up. You could easily, you know, break it up into five different sections. That would be helpful. Uh, the roofs are actually pretty much all of them at both schools have been renovated. There's one section at middle school that's an older roof, but it's still in pretty good condition. So, I mean, we could put that on, you know, year three-ish, year four, you know, it, we, we have no leaks, knock on wood. So no need to really jump on that. Um, when it comes to HVAC, both schools are a little bit different. Um, you know, after all the, what's been all said and done with all the, fixing of the current units we have and the system that we have, uh, it, it has shown that we're in much better, a much better position than we thought we were. Um, you know, we'll touch base on that later with the indoor air quality testing. Uh, so a lot of this is going to be, you know, game plan towards what we think, you know, would be the best possible solution. Um, you know, whether it's, you know, adding AC, uh, upgrading the unit ventilators, they seem to be a very productive unit. Um, and, you know, I, what I did is I added window tint at both schools in some of the troublesome areas, and it was a major help. It dropped the temperature of the school down quite a bit, uh, made it more comfortable. Um, but along with that being said, you know, we may want to look into hiring an engineer or a construction manager to more or less focus on the systems we have at hand. Maybe that is beefing them up. Maybe that's just swapping out unit ventilators, maybe upgrading sections, uh, whether it be wings or, you know, breaking it down, you know, a more effective way, you know, keeping it simple. Uh, moving on to plumbing, really not much there, basically just keeping up with general maintenance. Uh, fortunately, silver lining for this year, we were able to do uh, a bunch of mini, mini renovations on the bathrooms, uh, cleaned them up real nice, and they're looking sharp. Uh, electrical, again, you you know, general maintenance through the years. The a lot of the electrical boxes are very messy. Uh, may want to think about bringing an electrician in at times just to start cleaning that up. I've found a lot of very odd wiring throughout the school. Uh, you know, certain things hooked up to certain areas it just didn't make sense, but it's worked for many years. So uh, next would be structural. I mean, both buildings are in very good physical condition. Um, knock on wood. We don't really have you know no cracking, no major noticeable wear and way. It is both schools are physically standing in good condition. Uh, you know, that goes without saying, we know there's issues in the 60s wing with insulation and windows, but you know, structurally sounding, it's pretty whole. Uh, playgrounds, uh, there could be some improvements there. Uh, you know, the central school one, it's built on a hill, uh, very, very, very difficult to maintain. And when it was, when it was built, it was built in sections. There's not really a lot of continuity there. It'd be nice to redo it, you know, not a major overhaul, but, you know, clean it up, try to bring in maybe some new retaining walls, some better fencing, uh, making it a little easier to maintain long term. Uh, and then the grounds, they're overall, both schools are really good. Um, you know, the middle school, we have the play fields. They're really good. The field hockey field could use possibly a little bit of attention. One, it's undersized. And two, it, that one tends to dry out a little quicker because there's not as much soil up there. Uh, and that leads to other, you know, other discussions, whether it be, you know, possible irrigation or maybe just bringing in more loam, uh, you know, extending the field, fixing fencing, adding fencing where needing. Uh, but I mean, overall, we're in pretty good condition outside. So, um, and then, I mean, there's other things to talk about, too, uh, for both schools. You know, there's other factors, whether, you know, if you guys still are trying to reach and go for a renovation, that would obviously alter the five-year plan. Um, you know, like I said, irrigation, if we want to look into sprinklers, uh, the trailers, that's another big thing. They're, a couple of them are end of life, getting to be end of life. Uh, you know, they're a structure that you don't really want to keep sinking tons of money into because, these types of buildings are made to be temporary, um, you know, and then smaller ones, you know, things that I, a couple of things I never really put in there because it just didn't really, you know, fit what we were going for, but like, we're going to have to look at, you know, upgrading, you know, vehicles, the van, the mower, you know, equipment upgrades, small things that you want to fit in there as well. But, you know, the big picture is 
when it comes to the five-year plan, you know, our big focus is on the building itself. Like I said, roofs are doing pretty good. Fields are overall pretty good. Playgrounds could use some attention. Ceiling tiles, that's a given every year. They just, you know, many, many rooms and hallways haven't had them done in quite some time. Painting's always needed. Flooring's always needed. Um, you know, and it's just, you know, trying to figure out exactly what path we want to take with HVAC. That then will uh, determine what electrical we'll need. So it was kind of difficult putting numbers in there. And you may see how I have HVAC, you know, kind of a low number per year. Uh, you know, it's more of a marathon with my with my game plan. You know, if we just start making, you know, efficient upgrades, you're not going to need that million, two million dollars right up front. You may want to section it off. You may want to worry about maybe doing a certain win. You may want to look into air conditioning. You may want to just get a whole reevaluation. But I mean, that's going to be a little bit above me. And I would recommend looking at alternative paths, you know, again, hiring an engineer or looking at a construction manager to go forth with that. Um, but I mean, this will give you a general idea of what needs we have and what should be looked forth. So that's basically it. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Um, any questions, any questions from board members? So Jeff, this is David. Um, my first question is on the equipment side. I know that I think it was just a couple weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago. Uh, we were asked to fund um, a piece of equipment for around that twenty-eight, thirty thousand dollars. Do you see? I don't see anything else here in equipment. I know you, you briefly talked about it, but do you see any other major piece of equipment in the next couple of years, at least? Uh, fortunately, I don't. We just bought a truck a couple of years ago. Um, other than that, I mean, the tractor was the next big thing. We do have a van that's getting kind of old. Knock on wood. Again, it's it's still running. It's going strong, but I want to say it's about eleven years old. Yeah. So you know, it could be. We can push it, you know, it, it doesn't do a lot of mileage, but you know, that's probably the next big one, a van. Other than that, maybe a mower, you know, in the next couple of years as well. But again, we've had really good luck with it, so. Anyone else have questions on this? I know that- uh, Okay. Uh, just Jeff, I know that we'll want to talk soon about um, HCS and the renovation. You're on the list to talk to, as well as others, about what that plan would look like and if some of those numbers would be incorporated in that plan. Uh, so we'll be in touch very soon on that. Um, so there's definitely a, some pieces there you brought up about the HVAC, ceiling tiles uh, that we've started talking to uh, Trident about uh, that would be incorporated. Uh, and then I want to say thank you because I think since you've come on, You've uh, shined the light on some areas that maybe weren't uh, being kept up to date as, uh, you know, when we're bigger SAU. So bringing you on board as a direct staff on uh, the school district is, you know, just worth its weight in gold. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments or questions on the facilities extended plan? Okay. Seeing none. Jeff, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Next up is the an update on the 2020-2021 Safe Learning Plan update. Um, so we're going to turn this over to Mr. Flynn to give us an update on So um, just, uh, I'm gonna let Dr. Metzler go ahead and lead us off. You'll be hearing from a bunch of us this evening. We're gonna be in and out uh, on this presentation, bouncing from principals to directors. So um, just bear with us, but Dr. Metzler is gonna go ahead and get us rolling. Sorry, Mike. How was oh, weird? No. Okay. <laughs> I was gonna say that's yeah. No. So you know, first, first and foremost, you know, I want to thank uh, thank the community. Um, you know, you've you've been tremendously patient uh, throughout. Um, you know, we've we've put together what we believe is a is a remote platform that I think will be an asset 
uh, to the district for, for many years to come um, with a plan you know, to try to get uh, back to our, our new normal in person as soon as possible and as, as safely as possible. And so we've worked hard on that. Now, you know, it was just a week ago and, and we have three meetings in a row now, you know, this week, next Tuesday and the following Tuesday, a trilogy, if you will, of the safe learning plan. And week to week, things change so quickly, you know, so what has changed since last Tuesday? Well, last Tuesday, you know, we, we made a recommendation to, uh, to try to get, get everyone back um, on, the, uh, on the 2nd of November. And we get uh, alerts in terms of, you know, what's our, what's our, uh, what's our risk factor here in terms of uh, COVID-19. Well, we've, we've gone since then from a moderate chance uh, to an at-risk of an outbreak uh, in Rockingham County. So that's, that's one variable that we don't have control over. It's just one that we have to look at. So um, we're, we're sensitive to that. The second, the second piece is, you know, we, we had surveyed and, and had a pretty good idea about, you know, what our percentages would look like, what the split would look like. Um, you know, we talked about 80-20, 75-25, something like that was potentially something that we thought we might be able to do um, if everybody decided, you know, if those were the percentages where, where people asked to come back. Um, so the percentages, you know, so we surveyed and uh, our percentages came back at, at 85-15, which, um, which are very difficult numbers to manage if, if everybody's... Uh, um, looking to come back. Um, we have staffing, we certainly, um, but uh, that the, the debate was really over is three feet with a mask safe or should it be six feet with a mask? And so we've all um, agreed that it is six feet and um, that makes this very challenging. So as we go through this safe learning plan, uh, we're gonna provide um, you know, the board with all the information and data. Um, we, and, and obviously this week, next week and the following week, really get to what we believe is the safest learning plan. But I need to caution at this point right now, you know, we, we've set up for six feet with masks. So some of this plan that you'll get a chance to look at. And um, again, I'd like to, you know, uh, commend the staff. Um, again, Jeff Mackey, second time tonight, if you weren't on the goals, uh, you know, great job with our facilities to get, get them ready for um, whatever's next, you know, so we need to make that determination. But, um, you know, we, we thank you in advance for your flexibility, and, and uh, I, 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 um, we have about 65 families that have not indicated one way or the other, so that, that's an unknown as well. So we're at 85-15 right now, 85% looking to come back, 15% uh, uh, prefer the remote learning, and um, we have about 65 or so uh, that have not uh, decided, so, um, or have not indicated, I should say. So uh, that, that's challenging as well, but... Um, you know, so that the direction has been given to try to look at and find a way to get back in some capacity. And so um, that's what we're prepared to present tonight. And, um, and then we have to make some difficult decisions. So, um, so thanks, Mike. And uh, why don't we get started with our, our slides? All right. So the first area of focus this evening is going to be uh, facilities. And Mr. Mackey is going to go ahead and, and lead the discussion in regards to the indoor air quality, the air exchange, uh, and the HVAC systems. All right, so starting off with the indoor air quality, as we discussed at a prior meeting, the readings came back as if it was an outdoor environment, which proved to us that our system is up and running properly, um, and which was a good sign. Uh, the next slide is gonna be air exchange, which gives us a little bit more in depth on what's coming in and what's going out uh, for each school. Uh, for the Hampstead Central School, so the key is <clears throat> the we run off of mostly unit ventilators at both schools. With that being said, uh, when I talked to the Lawson group, they had mentioned I asked them what <clears throat> excuse me what a goal would be for you know how many air exchanges per hour, and they gave me the answer that <clears throat> the readings that they go by are from the American Society of Heating, Refrigerating, Air Conditioning Engineers. With that being said, they have no real standard on unit ventilators, but they do have a general standing of and around. You want to be above one, below three, you know, be in that two-ish area for <clears throat> air exchanges per hour. And as you see, most of our rooms have read in that realm. There were a few off. Uh, Central School in particular, let's see, I want to say room 127. That actually, that room, after we did it, I found out that the unit ventilator in there was uh, acting kind of funky and my HVAC company came in and ordered some parts. So that reading would actually improve a bit 
from the uh, 0.93. All the others, for the most part, are going to be in that working realm of what we want and are looking for. Uh, when we move on to the middle school, uh, let's see, we have a couple on here. The 12 and the 0.68 stick out. So the 12 <clears throat> in those classrooms, that room, I believe, has an exhaust vent directly above that room. So it may be reading a bit off um, due to the closeness of the exact uh, vent. The 0.68 in room one, six, one, uh, 611, it was interesting. After we did the testing, it showed to me that that room is one of the only rooms in both schools that doesn't have an exhaust vent. Uh, I'm looking into seeing about adding one um, because there's two in the room next to it, which is kind of unheard of too, because most rooms just have one in, one out, or multiple ins, multiple out. Um, so it may have been a flaw many moons ago when they were doing the HVAC in that room, uh, but that's going to be addressed hopefully soon. But all the other readings come around to that comfortable uh, air exchange uh, that we're looking for. So, on to the HVAC. So the HVAC I would say is up and running to about 93% up from 60. All exhaust vents have been maintained, every single one of them. We had about 12 combined at, from both schools that have been down for years. Uh, every other machine either had bearings change, belts change, or some sort of adjustment to get running to what they're at right now. Uh, since my coming on board in October of last year, my goal was to get whatever systems we have up and running. That way we could you know, assess accordingly to figure out what you know, what actual condition we're in. Like I stated before, we had many vents that have been down for many years. So I know we've had some other testing done and it just didn't show what the full reading really was, what we were dealing with. Um, and, you know, obviously once COVID hit in March, you know, HVAC was kind of top priority. And shortly after that, I was finding out about all these uh, issues and, you know, we made the leaps and bounds that we had to to get to where we're at now. So in, so in short, um, our HVAC system, uh, which we thought potentially wasn't um, what we had hoped it to be, uh, it appears to be in, in pretty good shape. I, you know, we credit, you know, obviously Jeff for, for, for helping, um, you know, and taking this on and getting this to where it is. But I think our air exchange rates and our air quality, uh, we're in good shape there, right? Would it be fair to say, Jeff? I would agree. And talking to my HVAC company, who has dealt with many other school districts, such as Bedford, Alvern, Hollis Brookline, and a handful of others, they they stated that our system is, you know, it, it's good, it's solid. You know, you know, of course, it's aged in areas, but you know, with the right maintenance and you know, hopefully steps forward, we can, uh, you know, beef it up. So. And the other thing to point out is all the readings that came back when the numbers weren't, I'll call adequate. Uh, Jeff immediately went to assess, and, and obviously the one room, uh, it, it, there was a failure within, and then obviously the one at the middle school, uh, we found the flaw of the two vents in one room and not in the other. So the readings allowed us to attack even more uh, and, and target areas uh, that we needed to improve. So that's a compliment of Jeff as well. Can I ask a quick question before you guys move on? For the air exchange, what do the high numbers mean? So Jeff, you had said you're kind of target, you want to be around two, that that's kind of the industry yeah, standard or, or whatever. Yep. So what are the, like the one that says 12, what does that mean? That there's so it too just much means, air moving? Yeah, like it just means that there's more air either coming in or going okay. out. So depending on those okay. rooms, uh, each wing kind of has its own certain, you know, take middle school, for example, the original section was built in 78 that mm -hmm. system is all basically the same then there was an addition in 91 92 that's it that system's different than the 78 but it's the same amongst that that uh, that wing and uh there's different vents on the roof and some are closer obviously they have them spread out so some classrooms are closer than others and for some reason that one was just reading high and i believe it's because that room is very close to where that vent is where the Exhaust vent okay. comes from the room to the roof is very close. So it's just sucking out more air in that area. So Jeff, would it be fair to say um, that those rooms when air exchange rates are high, 
uh, that perhaps those are rooms that we may struggle not only regulating airflow, but also heating and cooling. Possibly, possibly. Because it'll be sucking out too much air. So if it's bringing in cool air and it's taking out, you know, it's just... It's taking out the hot, so. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And just some safety measures throughout the school. Um, as you can see in the pictures, I have just got absolutely crazy amounts of boxes. And this is just at one area. I probably have double this, if not more, um, of wipes, disinfectants. Those are five gallon jugs of it. Um, I have many others on the shelves to the right of those jugs. Uh, boxes of sanitizer. Um, uh, you can see in the office, I took one picture of the plexiglass that we have. More is on its way for soon to be classrooms. And throughout both schools, I have many, many um, automatic and manual dispensers for hand sanitizer, especially Central School, uh, where we have the limited sinks upstairs. Um, sanitizer will do the job and we have plenty of it right now, so. Okay, I'm gonna jump in here and talk about uh, some of the staging that we did for the presentation this evening. Uh, Mr. Mackey walked around with the principals to develop uh, just a visual for both board members and the community members of what possible classroom setups will look like. Up top, you'll see two middle school classrooms. Uh, one's a science lab, the other one is uh, just a ELA or excuse me, social studies. Uh, you can see how the trapezoids would be set up uh, and versus the lab tables. Um, Compliment, I know Mr. Knowles is gonna speak about it today, but I, the fifth graders enter the building today and, and again, I think kids never cease to amaze us and, and how well the fifth grade students who technically was their first day in there um, did unbelievable, didn't even blink, um, followed the instructions, spaced as best they could as we're learning new practices and procedures, but uh, that's just a compliment to them. But these are two of the classrooms they actually use for testing today. So you saw how we were able to space them out. The bottom pictures are pictures from Central School. On the left there, uh, you see my left, uh, the trapezoid set up with students on each side. We took that picture as a visual uh, to understand that that's, that is not six feet. So what would be required uh, in regards to spacing would be some type of divider or the plexiglass that we were speaking about. Um, and then on the right side is the, the single desk standalones, which makes it the easiest in regards to spacing at six feet. I, uh, Mr. Collins and Mr. Noll are going to jump in on a, on a few slides here and discuss some of the procedures that they've established. Hi, this is Dillard Collins. I'll get us started with talking about the uh, Central School. Um, if you, as you can see, um, we're planning for buses and car arrival. And we're going to have to do some adjustments with some of our past practice. For example, when the buses arrive, they'll be getting off one bus at a time and they'll be strictly channeled directly towards what is referred to as the BZ door. That's the little door that's in the courtyard, which kind of feeds into the area. Um, car arrival, we're actually going to spray out where kids are getting out of cars. There was an earlier survey that suggested we would have as many as 50% of the families driving their students when we open the building. So therefore, the past practice is the students would typically go into the preschool if they're a preschool child, and then the rest of them would come into one of the two doors, but we're gonna spread out a little bit more. So when the cars go through the car loop and they come back around, the third and fourth graders will go into the front entry, that old entry of the 1940s wing. That's because those students will literally enter the building and go up the stairs and straight to their classrooms. Uh, or a couple of them will actually go down the stairs, just a couple steps to be directly at their classroom. So we're trying to spray the traffic around the building. We're gonna to have to be rather strict that parents cannot drop off their students till after 9.15. We're anticipating lots of traffic issues. So if a parent is planning on doing an office drop off, we would strongly encourage them to go through the car loop or wait until 9.15 because there's gonna be buses and cars moving all over the place. Uh, this may be one that once we get the practices in place that we may be able to start accepting card office drop offs a little bit a little bit earlier in the mornings. So the next slide please. At dismissal, uh, we're going to basically reverse some of these pieces. So the students will leave the building again through the BZ door. And in a minute, I'm going to talk about the traffic patterns around Central School. You'll understand why we're sending 
kids in and out certain doors. Uh, again, we're gonna do one bus at the time as the students will be waiting in a social distance area. Uh, we're fortunate that trailer number one is gone so we can spread the students out in front of the loading dock as they're waiting for the buses. Uh, we'll have a challenge if we have lots of students waiting for a significant period of time. So we may have to push them out further onto the playground area, um, putting them in pods strategically located. The car dismissal, we don't have a preschool issue at car dismissal because the preschool actually releases earlier. So what we'll do is we'll have all of the students that'll exit the building through the kindergarten entry exit area. And the students will wait by classroom group clusters behind the school. And this has an awful lot to do with the bubbles we're trying to create around our school. They will be able to cluster with a sibling or another member of their household um, if they have another um, family member at the school. Uh, but we are gonna have some of the students also wait over behind the garage area in a safe area that way we can spray them out. So as the cars pull up, there will be an adult with a radio asking for names. Uh, so we can actually call out on the radio so students can hear that we have a car here to pick up the Smith children or the Jones children or the Malcolm children or whatever. Also office pickups, we're gonna have to make it a point of emphasis that office pickups need to be done before 2.45 or after 3.45. People that have done office pickups know that there tends to be a large, large cluster of people that gather on the stairs or in the front lobby. So we, we need to prevent that happening. So we're gonna say that if you need to do an office pickup, we're asking that you do it before or after the big onrush of, um, of all of the dismissals. So that means people need to be in their cars to use it as safe distancing. Uh, on the car loop, the expectations, uh, we're gonna, both schools are gonna use a, a sign system where we're gonna ask that parents assist us by putting a sign, a very large sign, and we'll, we may even make them and give them to families. So they, they can be large, clear, visible letters. So if a family pulls up just to make it move quicker, we are gonna have someone put a sign on in a, that sign. If you happen to be picking up your neighbor's kids, you can put up two signs that say we got Smith and Jones. Uh, for the safety of all students, this has pretty been standard practice, but we really are gonna make this a point of emphasis. They must exit the vehicles on the passenger side of the car only because the traffic is moving on the left. Uh, be, also, we wanna make sure that you're ready for traffic flow in bad weather. So we can't wait for students um, during uh, really bad weather days it's not that we can't, is that we want to make it quicker for everyone to be safe. So, and then if you move on to the next screen, you can see this is talking a little bit about our traffic patterns. Our expectation, you're gonna hear this regularly from us, what masks are gonna be expected to be worn by students and staff and any visitors when you are going through the hallways at a social distance. Everyone must stay to the right. Keep in mind, Central School has some relatively narrow hallways. Uh, a typical expectation in a hallway is it's very wide in a school and ours are relatively small, particularly in the 40s and the 60s wings. Another thing is that students going in and out down the hallways are going to be assigned to a specific bathroom throughout the school day. And then you'll see the whole list there. Preschool, kindergarten, and grade one already have a bathroom in the classroom. That will be their bathroom for the day. We're going to minimize uh, children going to the, the common bathrooms just because of all of the tracking and the safety measures that need to be in place. So the grade three students will use the second floor bathrooms because they're all located on the second floor. Uh, the grade three students will use the first floor bathroom. We're gonna actually have them go down the stairs near their classrooms and go towards the bathrooms that are literally down the hall from the kindergarten rooms. And the fourth grade students will use the bathroom that's on their floor. You may know that we have two fourth grades upstairs and two fourth grades downstairs. Within the bathrooms, we're gonna have limits on all the bathrooms. We're gonna use a tag and time tracking system. And basically that means in little kid words, they're gonna get a little paw print. So if I'm a second grader and it's my, you know, I, I'm leaving the classroom, I'm gonna sign out of the room so the teacher knows the time that the child left. Many classrooms already do this, but we'll just make it a standard practice in the building. 
So the little child goes to the bathroom, let's say a second grader, and there's gonna be a place right outside of the bathroom where they're gonna put their little paw print. It's like a little cutout figure, laminated figure or such. And that way when a child walks up to the bathroom, they'll see that there's already three children in the bathroom, so they'll have to wait outside. We'll have a little marking so children can wait their turn to go to the bathroom. Within the bathroom, we're gonna make it a point of emphasis to let the children know that there's one bathroom that has sinks that are spaced out uh, almost six feet, that they could use those sinks at the same time. The other bathrooms do not have as much distancing on the sink, so we may close down a sink as an example. Um, so if there are two students that are using, say, um, a stall or the, the urinal or whatever, they will be able to use those with comfort and one at the sink, and then they, they can uh, move back to classroom quickly. So this is gonna make it very challenging for our second, third, and fourth grade students because they have to travel a distance, but that's just the way it needs to be. If you could go to the next one, I also wanna talk about uh, the building traffic patterns. I know people have been asking me, how are we gonna do this one? But base, the basic concept is that on the front stairwell of our school, because that's the open, stairwell it has been our standard practice for two or three years that if children go up and down those stairs they must be with an adult that's nothing new so if um you know mr smith is walking into building with a little kid he can stay with his child and then bring them to the office just in case you haven't been by the office we now have a cut through the glass so that um, the adults that are visiting do not need to go beyond the front lobby so they can actually drop a piece of paper off or something with a secretary that'll be at that desk. So, but if during the day, let's say the fourth grade teacher wants to bring their ch children down to gym class, they can escort the children down the stairwell. Our other stairwells are really undersized in big ways. The 1940s wing stairwell, that is the one that you can see from Emerson Avenue. That's what was the main entry until the 1980s. This will be the stairwell entry for third and fourth graders, as I mentioned earlier, but during the rest of the day, it's traffic up, which means the students can go up those stairs, but not down. So for throughout the rest of the day, if a child needs to go from the first floor up to the second floor, or an adult, or the principal, they have to go up those stairs. And if they need to come from the second floor down to the first floor, um, they will need to go down the stairs which are between the third grade and the first grade back in the 60s wing. So this is gonna mean uh, a lot of staff members and children will get a little, uh, quite a few more extra steps during their day. Uh, but unfortunately, that's um, the way we need to minimize the concerns about traffic. Uh, I, I wanna make it a point of emphasis that all of our stairs are gonna be used as a downstairs for egress or emergency. This does not compromise uh, emergency egress in any way, form, or, ma or manner. And also, um, signage is starting to go up in our school to say hallway traffic must always stay to the right, and students are to maintain the social distancing while traveling through the hallways. I do know with little ones, getting them to social distance is going to be a fascinating experience in itself. Anyone that's had two or three children at their home probably have an idea what we're talking about, but where we are. We're gonna to try to find ways to make it a fun piece for children. At the same time, be safe. And then um, HCS lunch and recess, we do plan on opening when we come back into the next phase to start serving lunch. That lunch will take place in classrooms. And this is because of an overarching theme of bubbles that I'm, I've been working with on my staff. Bubbles are going to be sort of the student comes in and they do not go way beyond that bubble unless there are certain exceptions that must happen. So if I'm a second grader in um, Mrs. Gordon's room, as an example, I'm gonna spend a significant amount of my day inside of Mrs. Gordon's room. My music teacher will come to me. My art teacher will come to me in my room. Uh, my computer teacher will come to me. You know, they'll work at their Chromebooks. Uh, we're talking about a second grader for PE, they will definitely go to meet the gym teacher, either outdoors or possibly the gym. And the, another important piece here too is when they go out to recess, they will stay with their bubble, their, their classroom group. 
Some of the exceptions would be if a child needs to go see a reading specialist, they need to go see a, uh, a learning center teacher or other certain programming, let's say a therapist, they would need to go to those pieces because we cannot send those people into classrooms without creating more problems. Um, and we'll also have to do things such as purchase extra sets of, re of recess equipment. So as an example, when students go out to recess, they're not sharing the same recess equipment that was used by another classroom group. I know one last thing that um, uh, Mr. Flynn alluded to at the last meeting is the discussion about our playground and having space so the children can play outside, but at the same time, keep them within their bubble again. So if we're talking about children on the playground, we can accommodate five different groupings on our playground. We can put one group over on the uh, playground equipment. We can put one group up on the uh, soccer field and there's a side field there. Uh, we could take advantage of that beautiful tent that's gonna be there for a few more weeks, um, but I'm not counting on that long term. And then we'll have uh, the big bus loop area where there's the basketball hoops and stuff along that line. And this uh, Mr. Mackey and his crew have been putting out there working with the PE teachers and some more games markings. And then there's always a fun thing happening with groups of kids on the hot top area that's closer to the back of the gymnasium. Um, you know, we'll, they'll bring out the equipment for the day. So in essence, if I'm a first grader, one day I'm gonna to go to one section, the next day I'll have another section, the next day I'll move on. They will not necessarily cross over from one classroom group to another until we get some assurance that children are um, social distancing in a way that we consider safe. I think I'm ready to hand it over to uh, Mrs. Danolo. Hello, everyone. Uh, many of the things that Mrs. Uh, that Mr. Collins spoke of that we are also uh, embracing at the middle school, we're very lucky we don't have a lot of stairs, so that helps us out a lot. Uh, usually our arrivals and dismissals come um, mainly one or two entrances, and that's part of our safety plan. Uh, but in this instance, we are going to spread out uh, where students come into the building. Uh, so the fifth and sixth graders, if they're dropped off by the bus, they will come into the uh, sixth grade wing door, which is on the far left hand side. Uh, fifth and sixth car, uh, those students will walk in front of the building and come in the main office door. Seventh and eighth grade students who arrive on bus will enter in the front cafe door which is two doors down from the main office. And then seventh and eighth grade car students will be directed to go to the back door entrance near Mr. Mayo's office where the um, portable classrooms are. Uh, this will increase the number of staff members uh, to help with this from, I, we usually had two or three people doing this. This will move us to about seven uh, people that will need to move us uh, to the different places in the building. So this shows you um, a, a Google Earth uh, site that shows you how, the, how we are spreading this out. Um, you will see, uh, if you look at the red zone, um, it comes to a, a, the right near the um, pavilion. That's where we have the student drop off for cars. Um, we're gonna have, this drop off site, just the one uh, direct line, we're not gonna take the L off of that. Um, our SRO gave us some um, extra advice on this system for dropping off the students. So we will just pull like six cars forward. And then as they're there, we'll, we'll have the students uh, exit from the cars and direct them to where they need to be um, in, at a safe, uh, safe distance. Uh, so at, uh, at uh, dismissal, we also will spread out into four different uh, egresses for the safety of uh, students and keeping people from bunching up and uh, congregating. Our next slide, uh, student dismissal, this shows pretty much it's the same uh, process. Uh, and the car loop ex, uh, expectations, we're also gonna be displaying large clear signs saying the last name of the student. We're gonna have the students come just into the passenger side uh, because of any traffic to the, to the left of the car. 
uh, and prepare, be prepared. So the kids have their things when they're ready to go. Um, a little extra time is gonna be needed to bundle up as the weather gets colder. Um, parents are pretty solid on this car loop expectation, but we will absolutely have extra staff uh, on the dismissal as well. And I believe we're gonna, uh, we're gonna increase that to nine staff members to uh, assist in this process. Our building, our traffic, our bathrooms, um, you know, we are going to try our best to do one way hallways when it is absolutely uh, optional or, or I'm sorry, possible. Um, We're going to stagger our transition time. So even though we have certain time frames where classes go, you know, from, you know, 10 to 1048, we may uh, shave off a few minutes here and there. So we have classes moving at different times. Uh, again, the designated entrances and exits. Uh, six squares, we're looking at uh, measuring that out today. And six feet is, is quite, a, quite a distance. And looking at our, our uh, flooring tiles, they're just you know, 12, feet, 12 inches by 12 inches, so it's just a foot. So six of those squares gives you an idea of how, what six feet is. Um, in the bathrooms, we have X'd off uh, every other uh, stall every other urinal, uh, designated sinks. Uh, we have um, that all taken care of. If you look at it, that's one of our tiles leading down to the uh, cafeteria. So six of those makes uh, social distancing accept acceptable. We go to lunch and recess. We have two options and I have to actually take this moment to thank the members of our task force, the HMS task force, was um, a, a number of people who met this summer to, to make some recommendations. And last week I had, I can't even tell you, I think I had 47 members who volunteered to go into subcommittees and just work through all of these different processes to many, many pages that you're seeing just a couple of bullets, but to get there was uh, quite a, an exercise and how does this work? What does it mean to be a fifth grader? And in my schedule, how do I do this? So we have two options. We can either eat in the classrooms uh, or we can eat in the cafeteria, uh, which would make us have eight lunches per day. And that is a long, long time that would go on forever. Uh, so half the grade would eat lunch and the half the grade would be out to recess. Um, and we'd also have to have some transition time. So I'm, I'm really uh, looking forward to a different kind of plan that we have perhaps half the, the students eat in the cafeteria where we have half eat at another uh, location during the same time. Uh, so we don't have lunch going on for so long during the day. That will be taxing on our, 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 um, our facilities and our staff. Um, lunch and recess, we, again, we, we talk about maintaining a distance of at least six feet from one another. Um, our recess committee that, that met, they called it refresh instead of recess. Uh, the equipment, footballs, tennis balls, basketballs, uh, those things would, would not be brought out during this time. And we would uh, zone some of the playground equipment, equipment that is used uh, on certain days uh, and look at alternative activities, uh, such as some of the painted games on the, uh, on the uh, blacktop and creating some obstacle courses on the pavement so there's no need for sharing of footballs and basketballs and tether balls. And uh, so that's, that's a lot to think of uh, with regards to recess. And, you know, the one thing I would say is that at least with, with we're very lucky that we have the equipment we have at this point. Um, when I first came to HMS, there was, there was really no recess equipment. So we've, we've been blessed with having more, um, but, you know, students can, are very, uh, handy at making up games together, um, making sure that they're six feet distancing. Uh, that, is, that's, that is definitely the challenge. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and take the last slide as I've been uh, focusing on the area within the, the nursing department uh, and speaking with, with uh, Ms. Houston and, and Ms. Dower. And just wanna reemphasize some of the practices that we'll be putting in place in regards to hand washing and sanitizing. 
Um, so compliments to the nurses uh, as we move closer to, to reopening uh, the facilities. Uh, you'll be seeing more information directly from them, um, but more specifically, we talked about uh, how important it is to wash hands uh, and educate both students and staff when to, when to wash, how to wash, um, you know, the signs are, you know, sing your happy birthday while you're washing until your hands are done. Uh, just some clever tricks so that we're making sure that, that we're, we're preventing um, any type of, of, of spread. And again, I'm just going to point back to the fifth graders today. Um, it's like they were doing it without even being instructed. It's, it's, I'd say it's common practice and a lot of the things that we're doing now with, with whether, uh, whatever you may be doing. Um, so certainly when we said, okay, everyone do this. Uh, no one really batted an eye. So uh, we'll continue to emphasize entering and exiting the facilities, sanitizing before you leave, uh, making sure masks are on at all times. Uh, we'll have max, you'll see more of that coming out uh, next week on, on mask, mask breaks, excuse me, uh, and, and those times that are going to be built in. Um, this, the, the, the patterns today, um, again, I'll compliment the staff and the students. Uh, the, the procedures that were put in place by the middle school, um, you did a great job. And, and, and I felt uh, that today went really well with, with traffic and students and onloading and offloading and pick up and drop off. So uh, those will be some areas that we continue to, to focus on. And I, I know, Dr. Metz, this is, this is your slide. You kind of alluded to it at the beginning, but here you go. Excellent. Thank you, Mike. And uh, thank you, uh, Maria and Dillard. Uh, as always, um, the details are are incredible and uh, you did, did a fantastic job pull, pulling that together and not necessarily a, it was quick but uh, it's something we've been talking about for, for months now so again great job so now as you as you look at our current um breakdown from in person to virtual these are the selections these are the choices if you will that people have made um i alluded to 60 some odd 60 65 obviously you can see there's 61 students that are that have not responded yet um not quite sure where they would fit on this grid uh, but these particular numbers, our current selections with six feet, uh, makes it impossible for us to all be back in at the same time. So we have some things that we need to consider. Uh, one is um, which option is the best. Uh, the, you know, obviously, we, we want to get back to school. Um, you know, uh, do we come up with something creative? Um, do we talk about double sessions? Do we look at something different to try to be back five days a week? Or do we look at some sort of hybrid model so that we can stay six feet and get and get students back? Um, you know, we did present uh, a hybrid model uh, as one of the options in terms of scheduling uh, last week. So that's something for the board to consider. So I know it's a lot of information to throw you at once, but um, we were hoping or planning uh, for a little different breakdown than 8515 with 61 kind of outliers. So I think um, what was helpful though, is the direction was charted. We were able to get some hard numbers. Um, that's the, the news, I guess, good news. <laughs> uh, we, we are going to need to um, continue to survey families as we go along these, this trilogy, these three meetings to kind of get to the safest plan. So I'll apologize in advance, but we're gonna need uh, to ask probably again, we're gonna, and we're going to ask, please, um, if we could get 100% you know, of the people to reply, we'll have a better idea about what we, what we can offer. But uh, the six foot is really the piece. If we were at three feet, we could do something a little bit differently, but we're not. We, we really um, determined that six feet with a mask uh, would be the safest. Um, in the event um, we were asked to consider something different, we certainly would, but that's, I think, where everybody is right now. So um, you can see the numbers. Um, breaking those down into separated by six feet. We just, that just will not work at this time. However, um, families again have until the 28th of October, you know, to make a decision. So perhaps these numbers might change um, one way or the other. We just don't, we just don't know. That's one of those things about being flexible. So, so thanks Mike. So at this point, we're opening it up to, to you uh, for any questions, comments. Thank you everyone for the update that we have now. Um, board members, questions? Sure, Caitlin, if you don't mind, I'll start off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, go ahead, Jim. Okay, 
Uh, first, I want to thank everyone for preparing this information. Um, everybody at both schools, the committees, wh whoever uh, spent a second thinking about this, uh, um, it's appreciated. I just wanted to start uh, with the masks. I know a lot of parents might be th thinking um, and some might be okay with uh, three feet, but myself as a board member and a, as a parent, um, I will fully support uh, the six feet in our schools with masks being required. Um, so let me ask my first question. Um, masks, are they required outside at recess? If I'm sorry, I was muted there. Um, so masks, we're, we're, they're going to be built in mask breaks. Uh, I know Mr. Nolan mentioned refresh when not recess. Um, so it, at those times, um, the, the team, the building little teams will, will what I'm trying to say is if they're further than six feet apart and they're appropriately spacing, then they can take the mask breaks. Uh, if, if, they're, if they're on the same slide and, and that goes with our, us educating the students and they're, they're within that, that shorter distance, then masks will be mandatory and required. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Dilit, I really like the thought process around the bubble, the teachers come in, out, in and out of the classroom. Uh, Ms. Nola, are you doing the same type of um, movement around the building? Would, Mr. would there be, move, be more movement of teachers into classrooms than kids around the building? And Mr. Sweeney, that's a great question. And that's something that my, um, my staff has spent a lot of time discussing um, in keeping the kids either uh, in advisories, which is already a, a pod that they're used to being in. Um, that's usually from 10 to 12 students. Um, and that's the amount of students that we could put in one classroom with the six feet distancing. Uh, and then, you know, we have to also look at if it's decided that people come in, um, that we are putting more than that many students in a classroom and going three feet, um, then we're, we're changing up the, uh, the equation. So we are looking at both of those options of moving uh, teachers into the classroom rather than the students moving around. But we're, we're still, we are, have both of those options open. It's just, a little, yeah, as Mr. Nell said, it's a little bit more of a different model with the amount of classes you have uh, compared to a contained classroom with elementary school. So uh, I know that, you know, Mr. Nola, we spent 20 minutes talking about it today, the, you know, what if, if this and that. So um, really that's going to be, it's going to be determining on the final number. Um, but we want to try and, and, and make it as safe as possible, a safe learning environment that we keep talking about. Great. Thank you. Um, just, uh, I, I do have several more. Uh, do you want me to keep on going, Caitlin, or? Sure. Well, maybe I'll have asked some, something that someone else will ask anyways. So I saw the plexiglass on one of the, those quad tables or whatever you call those tables. Um, can you can you talk about that? Is that something we're going to go with, or if we go hybrid, you might not do that? Um, if you do do it, is there a certain height? Is it just going to be straight across? Is it going to envelop the the child a little more? Like for example, if you were sitting at a square desk, you might put it on three sides of the child. Uh, just wondering. So. Uh, those the trapezoid tables or the lab tables um, you know Mr. Mackey spent time with the principals determining the needs of, of the plexiglass um, it's going to be targeted and again it, it'll be dependent on uh, the number of students per class but those are two by two plexiglass dividers so they won't uh, it will not be a three uh, I'll call it a threefold as you mentioned there at the end of your statement uh, it'll be a divider that will help establish another layer of protection if needed um, within the classrooms. So it's, it, it's not, it's not going to be on every single desk in, in both buildings. Uh, it'll be targeted to areas to help just with another layer of separation um, amongst students within the classroom. Right, right. Thank you. Uh, just a couple more. Um, at, at the middle school, Maria, it looks like you're using different exits to get kids out of the building. And I know because I have children at a central school, because the buses take up one side of the building. Um, and I think now because of, of the ways kids are gonna get on buses and move around in their bubbles, I, I think there's more potential for kids waiting outside longer 
and I'm just thinking about the the elements, the rain, the snow, the freezing cold. No, um, you're, you're, you're right. It's the pasting. And that's what we experienced today. Uh, we had a, you know, pouring rain day in our first day of seeing fifth graders or any students in our school like this in seven months. It was a uh, eye opening. Um, I was very wet, uh, but we kept the students inside the building as as long as possible and then got them to the buses. Um, the that 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 did take more time. No, you're right. And, and that was it took more time to get the students in. It took more time to get the students out. And we had to absolutely uh, display patience. And even one bus turned around, you know, after they had left the campus to come back for a little one that uh, that had gotten a little confused. So, you know, we aim to serve and please, um, but it definitely took us more time. Thus, when we talked about adding additional staff to what we usually had was two or three people, we're going from seven to nine staff members. So there's gonna have to be some shuffling um, of, of adults to get the students where they need to be and also to keep reinforcing the six foot spacing. That was the challenge. Right. But uh, thank you, Dillard. So uh, does that mean more kids will be waiting outside longer now in the in the weather, or because I know we have less doors for kids to go out of because we have the car loop on one side and the buses. What we've done in the past is we've been able to use the gymnasium as sort of a holding area for students uh, be before after school, I should say, when they're waiting for the buses. Uh, we're anticipating a smaller ridership on the buses. So I'm not as concerned about the buses based on what we've been told about participation. We will have a significant challenge with students in cars, uh, waiting for them. And we're gonna have to find ways. And again, that's where we're gonna have to use radios to space the children out. A conversation that Dr. Cheney and I were playing around with would be to actually start the dismissal of cars earlier in the afternoon, maybe as early as say 3.10 or 3.15 for maybe some of the families or, or some of the younger students and we'll have to figure out what's the most um, advantageous way to do that. Uh, the students typically are wait into their classrooms until they're called for buses. We may need to do something similar for um, car pickups this year. So I'll have to confess that we're still working through the details on that one. Thank you. Um, just a, a f maybe more than a few more. So I don't know. I'm going to keep on going until someone shuts me down. Um, are we going to have schools out? At, at, excuse me. I go ahead. Or, yes. Um, so for now, uh, before and after school programs or outside groups. Outside groups will not be uh, in our buildings providing services or using our facilities until um, we establish some routines and a new normal. We would take a look at some of those before and after school programs uh, perhaps in January, but at this time we didn't, there's just too many uh, variables in terms of um, risk factors by having outside groups in. Uh, we understand the frustration for parents in terms of uh, daycare, but uh, we're not a daycare facility, you know, we're, we're an educational facility. So we want to make sure we take care of the safe learning plan first. And I understand it's frustrating for parents because they need uh, these, these services, um, but uh, it provides additional risks that I think would make it hard uh, or very difficult, if you will, for, for the district um, to, to maintain a safe learning plan. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, two more, I promise. Um, uh, face masks. Um, that possibly could be children that cannot wear face mask. I don't, maybe have a me medical note or whatnot. Um, I'm assuming they'll be required to wear a face shield. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, yeah, yeah. Yep. So okay. we, we were already, believe it or not, those practices have already been um, put in place a little bit. We've already had students entering the facilities uh, in regards to services. So uh, we are accommodating and protecting both the student and the staff member in regards to those scenarios. Okay. My last one is about the, I don't think we talked about it this time, but we did before the quarantine rooms. So, I mean, you could have instances where you have multiple kids. Are we going to have multiple rooms for them? 
Um, the CDC, I'm um, excuse me, the DHHS, um, the Safe Opening Schools Plan, um, only asks facilities to have one with multiple beds, uh, two beds. We've already ordered cots for those rooms in order to accommodate two students uh, if needed. The real goal, uh, as we mentioned before, students come in and are, are showing the symptoms and we're addressing and sending them at home. Um, it's going to be part of the nurse's communication, but we're actually looking for obviously a quicker pickup. Um, and the goal would not be to have more than two in that. Um, there'll be other plans put in place that if the number does get above two, um, we'll talk about uh, using the nursing office and then having a deep clean after all those, I'll say, um, um, having a brain cramp those practices would be put in place so that we're not having a, a buildup in the quarantine room. So, so how about a real example? Um, let's, let's say the central school. So it would not be the nurse's office. Is that what you're saying? Correct. The quarantine rooms have been identified and, okay. and within the facilities and they are being, well, they're being prepped um, and they, they will have their own set. The quarantine room is separate from the nursing office. So, so that students it, can still come down with, you know, to receive medications or, or whatever, and it still be um, not a quarantine room. Right. So who would, if it's not the nurse's office, who would supervise the student in that room before pickup? So we spoke about the, the LNA positions last week. Uh, okay. All right. That's getting good. support to those. Yep. And then um, we have other contingencies in place if an LNA is not in place specifically to start. So. That goes into scheduling and, and things of that nature. And the same would apply for teachers. If there's some indication, you know, obviously they can just go home and walk out the door. Um, but I, I don't know if, if a teacher would need to be quarantined. But anyways, um, I'm done with my questions. Thank you very much, everyone, that answered my questions. I appreciate it. And thank you for your patience, fellow uh, board members. You always have good questions, Jim. I'm not cutting you off. Um, okay, any other questions from board members? Can't totally see all of you, so. I guess mine's a little bit of a yes, question, Kaylin. Um, yep. Seems that we've done a lot here to make this as safe as possible between the plexiglass, uh, lots of work on the HVAC and air exchanges, uh, a lot of talk about, you know, the, the hallways, mm -hmm. Um, in addition, lots of great work here. So I'm wondering, how did we determine the six foot and not go with some of the three foot guidelines with masks? Uh, I just don't see us doing anything more safe. And it, you know, from what I'm hearing, if we have to go to six foot, it's going to make it impossible for us to go back to school full time anytime without any real good guidance as far as what's the breaking point of getting us back in the classroom. So I don't know if Dr. Messler, that's more addressed to you or just some discussion here. Yeah, I think it could be both. It could be discussion. You know, I've had I've had a few few people reach out, um, you know, while this was going on about, you know, how do parents feel about three feet versus six feet and how would that impact choice and decisions? Um, you know, same kind of lead. You know, they said, wow, you got a lot of safety things in place. You know, how necessary is is six feet versus three feet? And and not to turn this into a finger pointing kind of activity, but um, obviously the things that we need to be able to do this, um, we need parents to make choices, which they have. Uh, we need staff and, uh, and an MOU in place, um, which, um, you know, that that's part of it as well. And we certainly need space. Um, all obvious, uh, point not the obvious, obviously. But uh, I think we, we looked at, um, you know, the state provides guidance. And again, um, you know, the guidance is just that. It's just guidance. You know, local control, the school board uh, will make those determinations. And, and, and certainly um, that's true about everything. The Department of Ed does not cannot mandate or dictate what, what the Hampstead School District does. No way, no how. Um, that's entirely uh, in, in local control. So we have to look at, I think um, CDC has some conflicting three feet, one thing, six feet, another. Um, so we looked at a number of, of slides. I think, Mike, if you would, you could jump in here too and talk about the different um, sources or resources that we used in order to, to come to six feet. But I think it was more of a collective agreement between you know, the staff and certainly administration and, um, and working out where everyone would be comfortable. Um, and, and I'm with you, Dave, in this regard, it, 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 
it uh, can be somewhat frustrating because you're right that that's the writing on the wall uh, in some ways about what we can and can't do. And if that means, you know, until there's a vaccine, um, that's not that's not great. So that's why I threw out. I know it's somewhat of a radical idea in some ways in terms of double sessions. Many districts have done double sessions uh, during construction. You'd say, okay, how are you going? You know, obviously then the details, right? How do you clean in between the sessions and all that? I mean, there's lots of details, just like the details you got tonight um, as, as another option potentially to consider. Uh, um, we, we have not developed that option yet, but I think, um, uh, Mike, if you want to jump in and talk about those different sources that, that, that we determine were the right sources to look at, um, in regards to what how what social distance should be the appropriate amount? Yeah, so just reverting back to where we started in, in, in initially, uh, the six feet was was the CDC uh, guidelines. Uh, now the three feet is the New Hampshire Department of Education uh, in regards to determining appropriate distance. And then when the numbers uh, selections came in last week, uh, we were setting up classrooms and discussing uh, safe learning environment for students. And uh, we mentioned, uh, I mentioned to Ms. Malcolm last week that the goal was six uh, and that we, we could try and establish a five, four, or three. And, and then in discussion with, with the administration and, and the task forces below, felt like as the numbers were, were creeping up past that, um, you know, the 20% virtual, we started to get into the class sizes of 18, 19, and 20. Um, so those are the discussions in which, as you started developing the classrooms and, and the numbers, that the six feet felt like it was a better, uh, it was a safer learning environment amongst all the, all the discussion of the groups. I'm trying to understand what's going to, is it the vaccine? Is that, that's where I keep on hearing the only way we're going to get back into full time um, from what I'm hearing here though. I'm not hearing anything about any other way that we get back into full time with the kids, even after all the, let's say investment we're putting in and we continue to put in for safety measures. Is that what I'm hearing here? Well, I, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. If, I mean, obviously <laughs> You know, you're doing the doing the math, right? It's um, if we have too many people and and not enough space to separate six feet, uh, we get kind of stuck. So that's why, for me, you know, I've been talking about this for a couple of weeks. However, not completely developed is is some looking at double sessions as potentially an option. Um, you know, uh, with with a couple hours in between sessions to um, to clean if 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 we had to be back full time and we thought that that was that was the priority, which I believe you know that is our goal. Um, I think uh, you know. Again, we need to have we need to have staffing. Uh, we need to get um, you know obviously an agreement in place that that staff is comfortable with um, with with the safety uh, precautions that we're taking. And um, I believe uh, everyone's at six feet at, at, at that time. So you know, parents. I know it's frustrating because parents are like, "Well, if, poll us. We want three feet." Um, and so we were. We were in that three to six foot range. But I think you know, right now we're at we're at six feet with a mask. Um, you know, I, I did talk to Dr. Powers today, you know, Pinkerton's at six feet and, you know, a lot, a lot of schools are at six feet uh, at this time. So, you know, the other question too is, and I don't mean to change the subject and by no means, it's just another question that, that came out through this. It's like, think about the difficulty for Paris. How do I stay six feet away from a student and help them? You know, a lot of times they're right over the shoulder. Uh, so, um, there, there are a lot of questions or challenges to being able to provide services and, uh, you know, uh, our goal is to get back, um, to get everyone back full time as safely and as quickly as possible. So something has to give. You're right, and it's a right now it's a mathematic equation, right? It's just how do we get all these people in six feet apart into these two facilities uh, and make and make this work? That's really where we're at. Right. I think that's what people are are going to want to know is what is that because everybody wants their you know as you can see I'll say everybody 85 percent of people want their kids back in school. And that's with the three to six foot range, um, as we talked about last week. So nothing's going to change there per se. Now there could be some numbers up and down, of course, um, but really there's nothing much going to change there. So what's the next thing to allow us to go back? And that's why I keep on going back to the vaccine and or what are other schools doing that are back full time right now? What are they doing that we're not doing? 
Yeah, I, I think, think some of those school. Oops, go ahead, Dr. Messler. Oh, no, Caitlin, go ahead. I was I'm just trying to explain. Yeah. Um, just this is just kind of anecdotal. I haven't gone out and looked at every school. I do know that some of it, what it seems to me with the schools that I have seen that have been able to go back in full is they tend to be districts even smaller than ours who frankly have the capacity already to have very small classes, very small class sizes. Um, and I do want to point out from what I've looked at from the DOE in New Hampshire, while they say three feet, they also have documentation that says with a goal of six feet. So frankly, I feel like it's another frustrating piece because we do have some conflicting information that we're trying to reconcile. Um, to me, it seems like six feet is the best standard. It seems, I, I understand that it's frustrating when we don't have the space to accommodate, a, if we don't have the space to accommodate a full return with that six feet in mind, but um, you know, we, we still are in a situation where there are cases, it is going up. For me, I feel like we, we do need to stick to the six feet. Um, and David, I totally get what you're saying. I mean, that means nothing, that means a full return seems almost impossible um, until we do have something in place where you can, when you have um, evidence that, that three feet or less or whatever is, is acceptable, but I don't know. I know that wasn't any like helpful, super helpful stuff. I'm just trying to. No, I just know that the goal is six feet always. And I think that, you know, some of the schools around us, um, that's their goal is six feet. You know, you look at Salem, Londonderry and others, uh, but they certainly haven't accomplished the six foot. So that's where I'm trying to understand what else can we do? It doesn't sound right now. There's anything else we can do on this. I hear you, what you're saying, Dr. Metzler, about the double sessions. Um, but other than that, it's pretty much telling parents we're going to be doing either hybrid or staying remote. I don't know these numbers um, exactly, but my understanding is that the schools like Salem, for instance, they had a greater um, percentage of their population select uh, remote learning than we did. It was really our challenge at 8515, that's a challenge. I mean, I've been trying to update you, um, the board, as, as the numbers were coming in. I'm very hopeful. I'm not sure where these other 61 students fit on this chart. Um, but I know that the current numbers are, are challenging. I, I had expected um, it to be a little different because our initial polling was more 80-20 and it, um, it really, it just, it just changed more, more people. I mean, people, hey, the, the community has spoken loud and clear. They want their kids back in school full time. And I don't disagree. It's just a matter of how do we do it safely and, um, and maintain six feet with a mask. That's really, that's the challenge. We have a space challenge because of the size. Um, you know, we have a, pretty robust population for the size of our buildings uh, in terms of square footage. Caitlin, I agree with you. You know, if, if my workplace can do it, restaurants can do it, the doctor's office, my bank can do it, then, you know, I'm, I'm going to vote for six feet. I'm not going to accept anything less than that. That's my personal opinion. And as Dr. Metzler mentioned at the remote of this, at the beginning of this, um, you know, Rockingham County has moved up. The numbers are ticking up all over. You know, it was over 216,000 Americans dead. Um, uh, um, it's about risk, you know. Um, my vote would be to reduce the risk. Okay. Um, I, you know, we're, we're going to continue to get updates. Um, does anyone else have questions on this for today? Um, just as a reminder, both to board members and to um, everyone from the public who's watching, this was our first of three updates. We have another update next week on the 20th. Um, that is not a reg regularly scheduled meeting. It's a special meeting we've put in place to continue to update and continue to finalize what um, our next steps look like. Um, so that's on the 20th. We will have another one on the 27th. Um, 
during our regularly scheduled meeting that we have set for that date. Um, and as Dr. Messler mentioned, um, the you know final choice for families um, will be on the 28th. So totally understand that everybody wants to gather information before they make a final decision. Um, but these numbers are things that we the, that the district needs in order to really make these final plans. Um, so with that being said, you know, more information is going to keep coming out. We're going to keep hashing this out and then, um, you know, families making decisions by the 28th uh, will be what is needed for that. Caitlin, just, um, just thinking out loud, would it be worthwhile to poll the community again um, to see if the numbers have changed at all or too soon? I would personally, and I would certainly like to hear what other board members have to say, I would like to see the update on the 20th. Um, I would like that to happen. Um, that'll be another week of time to kind of get some final details, some more um, details out. Um, I mean, certainly we can, but my concern with, with surveying every week is that as you guys as administrators and, and teachers and staff are trying to plan, if they're doing this, um, you know, numbers are going back and forth. I don't think that necessarily lends itself to getting to a final plan. That's my thought. Um, certainly board members weigh in. I mean, my, my choice would be maybe you survey on the 21st. Um, but it, makes, it makes sense. I don't, I don't want to increase the number of failed to respond either. You know, if we, if we survey mm -hmm. too often, you know, apathy sets in and, um, and then we don't, then we can't get the data that we need. So um, yeah, I just, just curious. I just don't know if, if tonight's presentation would impact people one way or the other. Um, I know that three feet versus six feet impacts people. Um, that's a, you know, that's a, that's a tricky, uh, you know, that, that makes people feel differently about safety, you know. And, um, also, mm -hmm. our, our, our buildings are going to be reaching out to those 61 non-respondents and uh, trying to gather that data over the next couple of days as well. Okay. Okay. I don't know. That's my thoughts. Anybody, board members, are you good with asking the administration to survey again next week after our second update or would you like numbers sooner? I'm seeing Megan. Yeah, it makes sense after the second um, presentation. I agree, Caitlin. Um, I think it would be helpful if Mike Flynn could gather responses from the 61 people who have not responded yet, but then don't do a complete survey until the 21st. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so a preview um, of what you can expect next week, it will be a plan to address the numbers as presented, right? A plan that we can actually believe we could execute. Like tonight we were telling you we can't, okay. we can't execute the full return at six feet. So we'll have to have something. Now, that will not be the double sessions plan. That will be probably more of a hybrid plan, right? So mm -hmm. would you like me to try to develop or talk about the double sessions at all or no? Or I, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, you could, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, obviously it's a, it'd be a ton of work, right? It's a ton of work um, with, with our unions. It's a ton of work, um, but it's to Dave's point. I mean, I, I, I want to see a light at the end of the tunnel too, too. I mean, how do we get people back? You know, if, if, if we think these numbers are too, too big and we can't do it, is there another way to get people back five days? That's, that's the part that, uh, uh, will frustrate us for quite some time if we don't have another plan. Now, that doesn't mean I need that needs to be on the on the twentieth, but at some point down the road, um, it, that may be our only other option, right? Uh, I, I. Uh. I think I would like to see us continue down the road we're on now before we add what is essentially kind of a, a third option on there. I, I don't know. I, I mean, we're already trying to, we've got full in, we've got 
hybrid on the table, the hybrid that was presented last week in terms of like the two, two days in, two days out, virtual on Fridays. Um, okay, no, no, just, I just, just throwing it out there. I mean, it might be something later, right? So now it's, it's been mentioned publicly, you know, people hear it. Uh, it may be something that we can talk about later. It does not need to be developed between now and, and the next, um, next Tuesday or the following Tuesday, but it is, you know, down the road, maybe something we need to look at, which is fine. I just wanted to, I just wanted to ask because we'll, we'll send, we'll spend all our energy. Uh, the preview really is now looking at what we can make work with the current numbers that we have. Mm -hmm. Question for you, Dr. Metzler, with the numbers we have, what are the, do you have a preview of the numbers we have to get to in order to be six foot distance? I'm sorry, Dave, I was just looking. <laughs> Could you repeat that? I'm sorry. So based on the numbers, based on how many students we can put per classroom, do you have the target if we were to be able to get to the six foot distance? Uh, the exact, you know, I, I do believe if we can get inside that 80-20, 75-25 to 80-20, somewhere in there, um, I don't have an exact number because it varies by grade and by class. If you look at that chart, um, I didn't know how the 80-20 was going to break out. I didn't realize, you know, some of them are are already at that 70-30 or 75, and, and some of them are, are greater than that. So that's where it starts to change. I think uh, I don't like, um, you know, having different criteria for different grades. So, um, you know, we got to look at this from a district perspective. You know, asking certain grades to stay home and having certain grades come in, I think, is a bad practice. I think for families, that would be even more frustrating, um, I think. Uh, so if you look at these numbers, you know, some may fit into that criteria and some do not, you know, I, you know, look at, um, for instance, look at grade seven, 87, 10, um, you know, that's, that'd be real, that'd be tricky. Uh, and, and going to this picture, um, this allow, this was at a six foot range, all these measurements were. So you're looking at three, six, nine, 12, about 12 to 14 kids per classroom. Uh, depending on the shape and, and, the, and the furniture within the room. So, um, and again, that, that looks different at the middle school than it does at the central school, but that, those were the measurements when we put in place. But did, did, um, was, that, was that easy to follow what I was saying in terms of how different grades would present different challenges based on the number of students that are selected? It's, it doesn't come out 85, 15, or 80, 20 across the board. You know, some of them, and we were, we were prepared to make some adjustments if we had to, um, you know, by grade, if one grade was top heavy, but it just, uh, um, so I, I think that'll be part of on the 20th. I think, uh, you know, let's come back with what we exact numbers, Mike, that we need um, to look at, at fully back in. I think, um, you know, there are a lot of, a lot of parents listening tonight. Uh, they got a chance to see uh, what this looks like. I know we're going to wait one more time, but I think, um, uh, before we survey them again. But in, in the event that anyone has changed their mind one way or the other, uh, if you could just please let us know because, um, you know, the numbers are, are really driving what we can and can't do, um, what we want to do, uh, what we hope to do. Um, it's uh, it's cre creating challenges. So uh, if, you, if we could get that out. So, all right. Yep. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, questions from board members on the learning update. Actually, I have a I have a comment or a question. Could you go back to the slide with the students in the classroom? And I know you're not presenting anything yet, but I just have a basic question and a concern that I'm thinking of. Are you talking the amount the, of kids in each class? The example the classroom numbers. pictures. Last the num oh, the numbers. Okay, sorry. I'm just trying to figure out like how would a hybrid even work when there's <clears throat> 21 kids in remote, you cannot afford two third grade teachers to teach two virtual classrooms. You're going to need all your teachers to teach the hybrid. Yeah. But if um, you only have half of the 74, if you were in a hybrid and you only had half of the 74, you're I mean, still going to need the teachers. You, you're not, I mean, you're going to dedicate two teachers for 21. And what's going to happen with a fourth grade class that has eight? You know what I mean? 
I, I'm just wondering what's uh, what's going to happen to the virtual kids. So that I think there's going to be a lot of a lot of change. I, I'm thinking that their their time in front of their teachers is going to be decreased. Um, maybe not fourth and fifth. I don't know what would happen there if you combined. Why you couldn't combine grades? That couldn't happen. So I, I don't even know. We we don't need to talk about it now. I just I was just looking at the numbers and trying to figure out how would that would even work. I mean, I, I, I've heard, uh, I have family members that are teachers and I've heard from others in the community that are teachers that um, hybrid is a nightmare. Um, I'm not saying, you know, stay 100% remote. I'm just, I'm just trying to wrap my head around it. Good luck to you guys doing the planning. I, uh, I appreciate all the work that goes into something like this. Okay. Uh, any other questions before we move on to our the rest of our agenda? Okay, seeing none. Um, going on to substitute pay increase, uh, Mr. Flynn. Yep. So this came up last uh, week in, in anticipated challenges, uh, and then we were asked to uh, go back evaluate what we're currently offering. Uh, and kind of discuss an opportunity to, I'll say, bring it to base level as well as uh, to become more attractive uh, when we're trying to certainly uh, fill spots uh, throughout the year in regards to absences. So, hang on one second. You can see the Excel sheet, thumbs up. I'm talking to a class. Um, okay, great. So up top, uh, <clears throat> you'll see what our current rates are um, for non-certified, certified, and a nurse. Um, first column is daily rate, and second C column is your hourly rate. Uh, and then currently, our substitutes uh, get a bonus of $25 uh, when they do five days consecutively. So uh, in speaking with um, Dr. Metzler, uh, increasing the rate by 25% would bring us on par with the surrounding districts. Uh, that would be non-certified at, at the 87.50 for the day, certified at $100 a day, uh, and the nurses would increase to 218. Our recommendations would be on the right-hand side there of um, a $50 COVID pay uh, while we are in uh, COVID, uh, a COVID system, whether it be phase one or phase two, uh, excuse me, phase two or phase three. Uh, and and then also a recommendation down below is that you do five consecutive days that we increase that pay. Um, that would put us um, certainly in great competition, if not above most of our surrounding districts. So we would become the more attractive area to uh, substitute during this time. Um, but you know, the first step obviously with the, the 25% would put us uh, on par with where most people are paying now. Uh, and then that the COVID pay is what we, we classified it at excuse me, classified it as uh, would be uh, that bump to become more attractive to serve our community during this time. Questions, comments, concerns? Um, could you maybe minimize it a little bit so we can see what's on row one? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sure. well, maybe it was me. That's good. Okay. Okay, thank you. I personally think this makes sense. I think even before COVID, this would have been a decent pay scale um, for substitutes. And we already, you know, as, as you guys have brought to us, we and what we've seen um, in surrounding areas, substitutes are going to be at a premium. Um, and to clarify that going... fifty dollars. Oh, I'm sorry, Caitlin. To clarify, those that fifty dollars would go on top of the daily rate, so the eighty-seven fifty, the hundred, and the two eighteen. And then after the five days, that other fifty dollars would kick in. So every five days, which certainly during this time would become more attractive to maintain people on a regular basis uh, when needed. Mm -hmm. Okay, board members' thoughts. Mike, you said, questions. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Caitlin. Nope, I was just saying questions. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I apologize. Uh, Mike, you said this, is, this would bring us at um, other rates surrounding us? Correct. Right, but 
let me let me ask this way. We always say Hampstead's different. We go above and beyond, try to keep our class sizes down. Um, do we want to be at what others are, or so want to be I, above what others are? I'm just wondering. Yeah, let let me phrase that. So the 25% increase. So the initial numbers over here that would bring us at par for what surrounding districts are on a daily basis, non-COVID. The $50 bonus a day would set us above mo most districts in the area by 10, if not $20 a day. So I, that, would, that would be setting the bar for the surrounding towns. That bonus of the five days consecutive of $50 would also bump us above uh, surrounding towns. So uh, the, the at par is more specifically to the daily rate. And if you want to discuss improving that, I, this is an Excel sheet. All you got to do is tell me a number and I can put it in and it'll show up right now. And what does everybody else think? Is this good enough? I, I personally think this is good when we add in the kind of bonus aspects, et cetera. I'm also but, not a substitute, so I don't know what would entice me to choose one district but, over another. But after after the bon after the bonus is over, we're just we're just average. Do we want to be average? I'm I'm just I'm asking. I don't I'm not you know trying to spend the town's money willy nilly. I'm just kind of talking about Hampstead and you know do we want to set ourselves apart or maybe this was. A, for me to answer that, I'd want to know when we're saying uh, we're average, average to who. So knowing what who we compared ourselves to and what the going rate is for the different uh, districts in the area. You know, I don't know what those are. So I think that'd be good information to provide to us. I can certainly put together a surrounding town analysis uh, of what sister districts and or other districts are paying substitutes. I can certainly. Uh, I can uh, like the, I, the initial I, stuff is just discussion. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I, I can say without looking um, that these rates are better than uh, than everywhere else. But um, to Caitlin's point, you know, in a really big district, you know, substitutes have some selections that they can make. They would typically say, "I, I only go to this building. I'll only go to these classrooms." Um, to answer your question about, you know, we have great kids, so I, I know the subs that we have, you know, love coming to our buildings because. You know, they, they get great plans. Our kids are super. Uh, they treat them really well. That matters. Just as much as these, these dollars matter, um, that matters. You know, people, people make that choice um, to do that work uh, for lots of different reasons. Um, this will help. Certainly, it'll make us more competitive, and uh, we'll certainly be able to draw. Um, but we have some intangibles that other places do not. And I think um, it's the climate and culture, and it's certainly our kids and, and uh and what our teachers leave for plans and, and how they support subs. Um, you know, I've been around, it doesn't happen everywhere like it happens here. So again, that's something that Hampstead should be very, very proud of. Yeah, I'm willing to accept the um, recommendation that's been made by Mr. Flynn and the administration. They're the ones that did the research on it and this is the number they came up with. I have nothing to say that it's right or wrong. So um, at this point, I'd like to make a motion that we accept the recommendation for subpay uh, that has been presented by Mr. Flynn. Second. Okay, um, any further discussion before we vote? Okay. Uh, Melissa, will you please call the roll vote? Ms. Malcolm? Yes. Mrs. Parnell? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mr. Sweeney? Yes. Mrs. Yusenka? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Okay. Thank you. Keep moving through our agenda. The 2020-2021 school calendar revision second read. So if you recall, we had a first read on updating the calendar um, at our last regular meeting. Uh, Mr. Flynn, any changes for second read? There is. So give me one second. Okay. So pull up another document.
Okay. Uh, so this was presented. I'm losing track of the date. This was presented to you a few weeks ago in which we had a discussion. Um, November 3rd is a now a non-school day, uh, a non-work day that, that was voted on by the board and approved. You'll see in December, uh, December 1 is an early release to accommodate for parent-teacher conferences, which will happen via Zoom, as well as the second, which will be uh, the standard off day to complete parent-teacher conferences. What you'll see new in our calendar uh, is something that Dr. Metzler and I had, had been in discussion with a couple uh, surrounding schools on, on handling um, this time of year. Um, and through some discussion and obviously within our own task force discussion, um, we, are, we are recommending that the week of the 4th and the 11th uh, be dedicated to purely virtual no matter what phase we're in, uh, in regards to uh, some of the, the state meetings that we've been a part to is uh, high anticipated travel outside of New England uh, for both students, uh, families and staff, as well as large uh, gatherings that can occur over that time. Uh, so in, in regards to safety for all, um, as well as possible disruptions with um, um, uh, attendance, uh, we felt as though the recommendation to, to make these two weeks virtual uh, would help um, protect uh, both students and staff. Okay. I mean, to me, this makes sense. That's going to be a really uncertain time post holidays. Um, and certainly being all virtual takes down that risk. Anybody else have thoughts on this? I think it's a good idea. I'm glad somebody thought of it. I agree. So this would be essentially not that we're moving back to a phase one, but it would be the same as a phase one setup, correct? So what we're doing now, those two weeks, uh, those 10 days, we'd be doing the same thing as we're doing now, correct? Correct, you'd see the virtual direct instruction model in which we've started mm -hmm. school with. Um, and go, going back to this allows us to, to transition and, and deliver appropriate instruction for times of uncertainty um, that we are anticipating at that time. Yeah, I mean, it just, I don't see any way around it, but just being kind of blunt. I mean, people are going to travel. Um, people are going to gather, regardless of where we are at that point in terms of numbers. Um, what's going to happen? We're humans who um, need interaction, and whether it's the best idea or not, people are going to travel, and people are going to gather in bigger groups inside. Um, and I would personally rather see this set up, this plan, which also means we're planning for it well in advance. Uh, everyone will be aware of that that's what's going to happen um, rather than potentially run into some sort of outbreak um, by the second week of January, forcing us into remote learning for a longer period of time. I don't, that's, that's my take on this. Um, I don't know. Was this saying that after every vacation for this year, we're going to do the same thing? So February and April? That's not um, being proposed as we speak. You know, obviously, um, we looked at the, the holiday break a little bit differently. I mean, somebody, you know, I had a long discussion today again with, with Pinkerton. Uh, this is the end of their, their quarter. And, and um, so they have some different challenges in, in January. You know, they brought up, what about Thanksgiving? What about February? What about, you know, so... 
those are considerations. We just felt like that, but this particular holiday break around, around um, whatever holiday you're celebrating, it's just, a, it's a longer break, um, more of an opportunity to potentially travel outside and, and have large gatherings. So um, the short answer is that's not something we're planning at this time. Um, you know, and it's not something we're going to say, Oh, you know, it's not, it's not something we're planning at this time, I think is, is fair to say, but we did think that this particular break was probably one um, that this might be a, um, a safe way to protect Hampstead uh, and also allow families to not have to wonder or worry if they can gather together and, and travel um, over the break. So. Um, Any other comments or questions on this? We have to vote to accept this. I believe so. I mean, it's a change to the calendar and we voted on the first draft. So this is technically the second draft. So I think we need to vote because last time also, I think, I don't know if somebody can refresh my memory. I think we were just the, the vote we took last meeting on the calendar was just to change the third of November to uh, a non-school day. I don't correct. think we approved correct. anything else. That's correct. Right. Okay. Okay. So I think in this case, a motion would be to approve the amended calendar as a whole, or the revised calendar, I believe. Okay, I'll make a motion to accept the revised calendar as presented in tonight's meeting. Okay, do we have a second? Second. Okay, uh, any more comments, questions, or discussion yeah, on this just, one? Just a comment. Uh, I'll be voting on this. I just feel our kids' education has taken a nosedive with all of this. I think that we need to be looking at different ways to provide a better education for our kids, getting them in school, and not planning around something like this. Because we're, we should be using the same logic then for February and April vacation. It's the same thing. Parents would travel. So I'll be voting no on this. Okay. Any more discussion? Okay, Melissa, will you please call the roll vote? Yes. Ms. Malcolm? Yes. Mrs. Parnell? Yes. Mr. Smith? No. Mr. Sweeney? Yes. Mrs. Yosenka? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, next up uh, is the union's MOU update from Dr. Metzler. Excellent. Well, well, first, um, you know, again, I, I know I, I say this each time, you know, I, I really have to thank, you know, Kara Gordon uh, and HEA and, and their membership. I have to thank Lisa Lambert, Hass, and their membership. You know, we asked them to, to turn around very quickly. And although I, I can't get into the details um, because we're still um, working that out um, uh, between the, the school board and, and uh, the, um, the two unions, uh, they, they were great. They're very efficient. Uh, we were able to get the, uh, some, some requests, I guess, in terms of language and, and our, we're working on that. And so um, hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll have uh, an agreement in place um, within the next week or two. And so um, again, uh, Caitlin, I don't know if you wanted to say anything to, about that. That's really the update. Yeah. Um, so Karen and I spoke with, uh, along with Dr. Messler to our district council today to start um, reviewing everything and, and getting that all in place. And as Dr. Messler said, um, should hopefully have that finalized in the next week or so. Okay, I think that's about it for the update. Um, Last item under current business is the 2020-2021 school board goals. So just to give an update on this, um, we had a workshop uh, before this meeting started um, to talk about what our board goals are gonna be. Um, we're working off of last year's goals and amending them um, and adding in new ones. 
so as far as timeline for that, um, we are looking at a finalized draft for the meeting on the 27th. And we'll be doing a final review and edit at that meeting. And then um, as long as we feel we have a final draft, we'll um, finalize that and hold a vote on the school board goals for this year um, for the meeting on the 27th. All right. Board comments and correspondence. Uh, does anybody have anything they want to, they would like to put in here? Unless I see somebody, I'm just going to keep going, but. Okay, not seeing anything from any board members. Uh, consent agenda, Dr. Metzler, do you have anything for us for the consent agenda this week? I do, um, we do not have a, a personnel report. Um, I am um, extending an invitation from Pinkerton Academy and the Board of Trustees uh, to the school board, the annual fall meeting that will be on October the 22nd. That will be at 6 p.m. I believe their platform, they're using a Zoom platform. So any of the board members that, that wish to attend, uh, I do not have the actual link invitation. It was just a, an invitation that is coming. So, um, you know, as soon as I, if I get that link and Caitlin, you have people that, that want to attend, any other board members that want to attend, uh, please just let me know. So that was, that was great. Also, I do believe um, Jeff Dowd prepared um, some sort of financial document or transfer oh, or something yeah. for you in your packets. And so that would be, um, I do not have that in my packet, but I believe you have one. Um, I do, uh, I do have it. Mike, if you wanted to allow screen sharing, I can share it out. Uh, very simple request for a transfer of appropriations. And if you recall, board policy DBJ, transfers appropriation, requires the transfers over $5,000 or more uh, receive board approval. I have uh, two transfers to request of you this evening. And there they are. The first is for $10,000 from custodial, or to the, our custodial supplies account from repair and maintenance. Um, this is to fund some COVID related purchases, uh, supplies more than, uh, more than purchases. And uh, $44,000, uh, $44,100. Um, and this is just a transfer within our 1200 fund, within our tuitions account. And that is just moving money from um, our tuition to private and other schools account to our LEAs, which is another um, local education authorities um, designation. So basically we, we budgeted money in um, outside tuition to be paid to a, a non public school entity. And we are we found a program that was a part of a public school system. So we'll need to pay it out of that account. So again, uh, requesting $10,000 <clears> to be moved into the custodial supplies account and 44,100 to move to the um, tuition to other LEAs in the state. And if that, uh, those two meet with your approval, if you feel free to make a motion to allow the budget transfers identified in the CFO's October 13th, 2020 memo. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to address them. Okay, let's start with the motion. So do we have a motion to allow budget transfers identified in the CFO's October 13th, 2020 memo. So moved. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you. Okay, any questions or discussion on this item for Jeff? Okay, seeing, hearing none. Melissa, will you please call the roll vote? Yes, Ms. Malcolm? Yes. Mrs. Parnell? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mr. Sweeney? Yes. Mrs. Yusenka? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you very much. And okay, Madam Chair, you. if I may ask the um, board members, I've sent out uh, the financial documents for review and for electronic signature. I only received one signature, I think, on one of the vouchers. At the, from the last meeting or, or the last uh, the last time we cut checks two weeks ago. So thank you, Megan. But I've just re-included that uh, voucher in with the current week's vouchers. No worries. So I've included that with the current week's vouchers. I just wanted to make sure that we didn't that there were no that it wasn't ending up in junk mail or spam mail. But uh, I did want to make you aware that that was out there. And if you have any questions on that, please don't hesitate to let me know. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, I apologize. I no forgot worries. to sign it. It's okay, you can send like 
mean emails if you want to remind people to find it. <laughs> I won't be offended. <laughs> he, got, he doesn't have it in him. He would never do that. I know. I know. You can have a board. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Messler, anything else under? No, that's consent? that's uh, that's consent agenda. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, any other or old business that anyone has? I don't have anything to bring up. Yeah, Caitlin, I don't have any um, old business or anything, but I just have a thought that um, about when we were talking about the um, the safe learning plan, just so that there's no confusion and I don't want Dr. Metzler or um, Mr. Flynn to spend time. I mean, I heard, I heard Jim, I heard you and I know me um, saying that, you know, for the, the safety of our students and staff and in compliance with CDC regs, we want six feet. I don't want them to spend time between now and then on uh, another plan and using another calculation you know, like a, a three foot or a four foot. Um, I think that, you know, we're in agreement that we want six feet. I may be wrong, but that's what I heard. And if that's the case, I would like to um, have the board either in a vote or consensus direct Dr. Metzler to use six feet in his calculations moving forward. Oh, okay. I agree with the six feet, Karen. Okay. Yeah, I just don't want the, I don't want our um, leadership to spend time on something that's going to come back to the board and the board's going to say, no, we want six feet. That's, that's fine. Okay. I mean, do you want to, do we want to do a motion or just a consensus one way or the other? Or either way, fine with me. Um, I'll do a vote. Um, I'll make a motion that any uh, plans that are being worked on by leadership for reopening use six feet um, in their mathematical equations. Second. Okay. Any uh, questions or comments or discussion? six feet with all the other precautions that are being put in place, masks, plexiglass, everything else. Is that a, what this vote is about? Yes. Okay. Any others? Okay. Seeing, hearing none. Melissa, will you please call the roll? Yes, I will. Ms. Malcolm? Yes. Mrs. Parnell? Yes. Mr. Smith? No. Mr. Sweeney? Yes. Mrs. Yusenka? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, anything else for other or old business? Okay. Um, with that said, I am going to ask for a motion for a non-public under two items, RSA 91A colon three, paragraph two. Um, I don't have my paper with me. C, that's our reputation one, right? Yes. yes. Uh, and L for legal. Can I have a motion? So moved. <clears throat> okay, can I have a second? Second. Thank you. Okay. Um, Melissa, will you please um, call the roll? Ms. Malcolm? Yes. Mrs. Parnell? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mr. Sweeney. Mr. Sweeney, I think you're muted. So, sorry, yes. 
Okay, thank you. Mrs. Yasenka? Yes. Okay, thank you. Motion carries. It is 9.16 p.m. Okay. 